Egg Farm and Garden Survival Hour with your host, Dr. Robert Faust. All comments, views, and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of Robert, his guests, and callers. Now, with the Bio Egg Farm and Garden Survival Hour, here's Dr. Robert Faust. Good day. Good day to everyone worldwide. This is Robert Faust, live and direct from Kona, Hawaii. Here we are early in the morning, the sun is shining here in Hawaii. And it's hard to imagine that the rest of the world is going through all the changes that it's going through. But so is Hawaii. Well, there's no uh, there's no getting away from it. We're all on the same planet, uh, floating in space, you know. And there's uh, we're all on the same boat, and uh, the seas are getting rough. So I'd like to first mention a study. I run into all these interesting studies um, that you don't hear about too often, unless you read New Scientist magazine, for instance, or Nature, or one of the scientific journals. Here's a particularly interesting one, uh, which kind of uh, kind of foreboding, really. I mean, it's, this is kind of scary stuff. Uh, glyphosate may encourage blight, but more research to be done. Always need more research if it's negative to uh, one of the uh, <coughs> major corporations that's pushing uh, toxic genetic chemicals. Uh, anyway, this is a piece of research. Um, Annie Coglin, a new scientist, uh, 816. A widely used herbicide encourages the growth of toxic fungi that devastate wheat fields. Nice, huh? Laboratory studies by scientists working for the Canadian government suggest if field studies confirm that the herbicide glyphosate, also known as Roundup, increases the risk of fungal infections, which are already a huge problem. Farmers might be advised to use it less. Maybe they shouldn't use it at all. Uh, that could be a major blow for backers of genetically modified wheat in Canada because the first GM variety up for approval in Canada is modified to be glyphosate resistant. If it gets the go ahead, there is likely to be an overall increase in glyphosate use. So here you go. See, again, it's marketing, it's not solving a problem. We've been growing wheat for thousands of years. Uh, wheat production is very successful without Roundup. Matter of fact, wheat, wheat uh, production is very successful without anything. When I, when I reviewed the 21 years of studies from Switzerland, wheat was in the rotation. They, they compared wheat uh, with conventional production and versus organic and versus biodynamic. And the lowest cost per unit of wheat was the biodynamic. And one of the main reasons that the organic and the biodynamic were so economically feasible uh, and was the fact that pesticides and herbicides weren't used. The difference was not statistically significant as far as yield goes. Um, so we know from ex extensive research that you certainly can grow wheat more economically feasible using biological techniques, biological agriculture. So here we go. Uh, the research shows we don't need herbicides. That we, that we, that the net profit is higher if, if we go biological. So here's Monsanto trying to promote genetically altered wheat. And, of course, they own the seed. If you replant your wheat seed, it'll take you to court and sue you. So you've got to buy your seed overpriced from them. And all so you can use their product. So you can spray Roundup on this thing. Well, the, the research here is pretty clear, I'm afraid. Uh, I'll go on in this. Uh, it says the potential problem was spotted a few years ago. See, a few years ago. And nobody ever heard about this. It was spotted a few years ago by Marion Fernandez of the, of the Semi-Arid Prairie Agricultural Research Center run by the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Swift Current, Saskatchewan. She noticed that in some wheat fields where glyphosate has been applied the previous year, Wheat appeared to be worse affected by fusarium head blight, a devastating fungal disease that damages grain and turns it pink. In Europe alone, fusarium head blight destroys a fifth of the wheat harvest. The fungi that causes the disease also produces toxins 
that can kill humans and animals. That's amazing. In a follow-up study, Fernandez measured levels of the blight in wheat fields. We found higher levels of blight within each tillage canopy category when glyphosate had been used in the previous year, said her colleague, Keith Hansen. And his lab study showed that Fusarium gramamensium and F. aventium, the fungi that caused head blight, grows faster when glyphosate-based weed killers are applied to the nutrient medium. So what we have here, which is something I've been saying for years, and people have accused me of conspiracy theory, that these pesticides are sold with the knowledge, full knowledge, that they cause other diseases. Now, here's a perfect example. If this isn't the perfect example, I don't know what is. So they found that something, they're, they're trying to induce, introduce genetically altered wheat to Canada so you can spray Roundup on it so that Monsanto can sell more Roundup, but it brings disease to the wheat with potential fatal uh, terminal activity with man and animals. It has potential toxin, toxins that will kill you, okay? So do we really need this product? And, of course, they'll market it like crazy. They'll push it like crazy to where people believe you can't grow wheat without it. I mean, that is what's going to happen. You know, you'll know, get everybody believing you can't grow wheat without it, and this information here will be suppressed. Somebody will be bought out or threatened. But there it is. I mean, it's published in New Scientist magazine. It's, it's the Government of Canada study. So... Uh, this is what we're looking at, and we've got to take this seriously. Uh, the agriculturalists and horticulturalists in North and South America, in the world, the whole world, are manipulated by the petrochemical industries. And it's, it's only, they're only considering their own good or the, or the bottom line for the stockholders. So, I mean, what, what morally sound company or individual would knowingly sell something that causes a disease to its customers. I mean, that's just unreal. So this morning, okay, I mentioned that in a negative, uh, in a negative context. So what are some of the positive issues? How, how can we get around this? Well, of course, if you have wheat that stools out heavily, rapidly, rapid, quick seedling growth and development, it'll shade the ground. Wheat grows in cooler weather conditions. It'll shade and choke out weeds, most annual broadleaf weeds, and before uh, before they're up, if, if you get good growth. And, of course, I'm going to be talking about how to use our products. For instance, a biomagic seed treatment or the humusolve in a row increases the root growth dramatically in the seedling. I mean, right off the bat, you get far more f- fibrous root system. That's our product, humusolve. USA, or one of the variants, like Humusol TM7. And I want to talk about Humusol TM7. TM7 means trace mineral seven, seven trace elements. And trace elements is one of the things that's uh, ignored in most cases. For instance, in this state, when you send in a leaf analysis or a soil analysis, they don't necessarily ever do trace elements. And yet what we find in, in a lot of the soils that I test is they're completely deficient in zinc and manganese, usually boron, and uh, frequently secondary elements like calcium. I mean, this is consistent, and it's never tested for. You know, they just go ahead with triple 16, and that's it. So that creates more of an imbalance. The more soluble phosphate you put on when you don't need it, the more zinc you tie up. The more potash you apply, magnesium, the more uh, you get a tie-up of manganese. And and it's not like these things are optional. Like, you know, it's a good idea to have trace elements. No, trace elements are absolutely essential. It's not not optional. It's not something that a crop does better if it has zinc. You know, a crop needs zinc to complete uh, enzyme... uh, complete enzyme systems, and for a lot of different reasons. And uh, if you want optimum growth and get your 
uh, you know, the best return for your investment in planting a crop, you need to consider all the nutrients that a plant requires. You know, so like we know that if you starve people from nutrients or livestock, I mean, farmers are, sometimes they're a lot more uh, concerned about the nutrition of their livestock than they are their crops. Whereas, if you were concerned with the nutrition of your crop, then you wouldn't have to be concerned about nutrition of your livestock, because the crops would provide the nutrition. And again, for human food, if we more concerned with the crops and the soil, we'd have better nutrition. And uh, so this is how, why I developed Humasolve TM7, because I kept seeing the same deficiencies crop up time and time again. And I'd have to make a recommendation of manganese, zinc, boron, copper, molybdenum, cobalt. And there just wasn't a product like that available. Uh, and then it was... Uh, complex in, in, a, in a matrix of humic and fulvic acids, a full range of humic substances acting as complexing or chelation. To keep those trace elements from tying up together, to keep them in an available form in the soil. That's what TM7 is. And we don't spare any expense either. The product has the trace elements that are absolutely required for nitrogen fixation by legumes. If you want to have a sustainable agricultural system, got to have iron, cobalt, and molybdenum. These are essential for nitrogen fixation. And this is something that we add. It's in the reaction in Humasol TM7 and in the ratios that are absolutely crucial. Throwing a whole bunch of one thing and a little bit of another just creates more imbalance. So the main benefit of our TM7 is it's absolutely the balance of trace elements including rare trace elements like vanadium, selenium, that are required for plant growth. And what a difference it makes. And people say, well, why should I worry about trace elements? Why should you worry? Because there can be a huge increase in yield when you're working with a deficiency of, say, manganese or zinc for years. And then when you replace that deficiency, things get a whole lot better. So... When we get back from the break, I'm going to talk more about trace element nutrition in soils and livestock and how can we deal with it and, and help our products. Humasol TM7 works to solve that problem. So when we get back from the break, we'll, we'll be right at it and tell you how to deal with these trace element problems. This is Robert Faust, the Bio Ag Farm and Garden Survival Hour. We'll be right back. Would you like to manage your crops effectively and successfully without damaging the environment or your family? Then visit www.bioag.com Travel Hour with Dr. Robert Now Faust. back to the show. Here's your host, Robert Faust. Hello, hello. This is Robert Faust, and I'm, I'm back at you here. This is the Bioag Farm and Garden Survival Hour, and we're talking about better ways of farming and gardening and really trying to give people a heads up on what's going on, you know, and how, how we're being manipulated and how farmers are being manipulated. If it wasn't true, we'd have more instead of less farmers. But we have only less than 2% of the population. We're getting a bill of goods. Farmers are called a market, and they're not even people. And uh, the idea is, is to intercept all that money that's spent growing crops every year. And it doesn't matter whether there's a problem or not. They'll create a problem. And so the trace element situation is one of those problems that was created. Uh, for instance, the zinc. I keep bringing up zinc because we know from research that, that even most affluent Americans are deficient in zinc. Due to this pushing of phosphate salts, soluble phosphate, has, has caused a deficiency of zinc because there's interaction and as the soil becomes less and less organic more and more organic matter humus uh, is oxidized less and less humic and fulvic acids these trace elements tend to combine and form insoluble complexes so the soil becomes more and more deficient so we see for instance in ancient corn growing cultures 
where they bury their dead in pyramidal mounds, like the mound builders of Ohio and the Midwest have already been through this. History just repeats itself. Uh, the bodies at the top of the pile had terrible dental problems. At the bottom of the pile, they had normal, n- normal teeth, normal bones, they're healthy overall. But towards the end of their civilization, which lasted, well, 10, 1,000, 1,500 years, maybe longer, uh, <clears throat> the deficiencies, especially in zinc, were really apparent. And then, of course, the tooth problems, the abscesses, the dental problems, usually from a deficiency in, in minerals in general, calcium, phosphorus. But as time goes along, the stature becomes shorter, the reproductive capacity is less. And in a way, it's almost a, well, it, it's a limiting factor of populations in general, like if you overuse your environment. But why is zinc so important? Well, it's not just zinc. It's all important. Fiber, folic acid, chromium, copper, magnesium, manganese, potassium, vitamin B5, vitamin B6, vitamin E, and zinc. Absolutely crucial and frequently deficient in the human being and in animals. For instance, zinc. Um, You lose 62% of the zinc in food just by processing wheat flour, by making taking wheat and making white flour out of use, you lose about 62% of zinc. You lose 96% of uh, vitamin E. Uh, This is a good reason to use uh, whole wheat. Zinc is necessary for the immune system, skin and cell membranes, linked with eye, skin and eye conditions, diabetes, infertility, fatigue, impotence, prostate functioning, and cholesterol metabolism protects against tissue damage caused by free radicals and environmental toxins. I almost need to read that again. I mean, sure. You know, you, you restricted them in, in, in like an eight-inch layer. And uh, that can't work, especially under stress conditions. Uh, the limiting factor of yield on any given field is the, is the soil depth, topsoil. And the more that's eroded, uh, the lower the yields will get. And you got a lot of people in the, in the East Coast and other areas uh, that have to be con- concerned with liming. Now, one of the false premises that was being espoused and espoused by this fertilizer industry is is using pH as a guide for for lime requirement. Like, for instance, if your soil is below, let's say, five point eight, uh, you need lime. Well, that's not so. Conversely, a pH of 7.9 that needed calcium line, uh, the plants were short of calcium. So you can have a high pH, um, and it will actually reduce availability. So this whole idea of pH is, is, is a mistake, because, and it's related to trace elements, because if you think, <coughs> based just on pH, that you need lime, and you put two or three lime tons of lime on that can induce deficiencies in trace elements. We call it lime-induced chlorosis. That's where that lime, excess lime, excess calcium, bringing the pH up, causes calcium and phosphate to tie up. And so you end up with a, a reduced phosphate and, and iron. That's what iron-induced chlorosis is. And also it will reduce, again, reduce zinc levels and everything else. In general, it'll reduce all the trace element and phosphate levels, that lime. Whereas what we really need to be looking at is under the Albrecht system, where we know that there's optimum concentration of of elements in the soil. Like calcium should be 60 to 70 percent, and potash should be 2 to 5, manganese 10 to 15 percent of the cation exchange capacity. So what we're really trying to do with pH is is keep the cation levels constant. And what's important as far as adding lime goes, that should be based on calcium requirement, uh, calcium, soluble calcium in the soil and the percent of the the cation exchange, and not just pH, because people are just throwing things out of whack. And and in many cases... uh, 
this, the, the need for silica, it's the need for not calcium carbonate or lime, but the need for calcium silicate, which is soluble calcium and silicic acids or silica. And that is really what is required for keeping that soil structure open. Otherwise, the lime uh, tends to combine with manganese and uh, as leaching and heavy tractor traffic, we get this compaction. We get a zone of compaction. And we see a situation where the magnesium levels are higher than the calcium levels. And that causes a hard soil, very hard soil. And just ripping it won't help. It'll help a little, but the problem is chemical. It's, it's usually excess magnesium as opposed to calcium. So if we had lime, calcium carbonate, we could bring the pH too high end up tying up all your trace elements. But what we really need is silica, silicic acid, in the form of calcium silicate. Now, we have a good source of that right now. We have a very good source of calcium silicate slag. And this is crucial as far as soil reclamation and getting the soil loosened up. But back to Humusol TM7, which is a very quick fix, too, for trace element problems. For instance, if you have trace element deficiencies, which most people do, and actually the symptoms are very visible in the leaf, like an asymmetrical shaped leaf, it's not, it's not perfectly symmetrical, or there's cupping in the leaf, or crinkling on the leaf, just abnormal. There, there's books, there's probably pictures on the internet that show you what these deficiencies look like. All farmers should learn that. And then when you start seeing deficiencies start to occur, and, of course, the leaf analysis can tell you also, but like I say, a visual tells you more because, uh, you know, it's showing visible symptoms. So you take the Humusolve TM7, and it's a very small amount is required because it's an chelated complex form with humic and fulvic acids, and you've got a complete line of iron, cobalt, molybdenum, zinc, boron, vanadium, selenium, and it's precise balance. This stuff is mixed with water at maybe two ounces of Humusol TM7 per acre, like three grams, between three and six grams and 10 liters of water. And then you wait till early in the morning or late at night, and the plant is absorbing from the environment, and we don't want to put it on there in the heat of the day because it's going to dry up faster than the plant can absorb it. So that's why we like to do our trace element in our foliar, any foliar application, in the early in the morning or towards the evening or in a cloudy, overcast condition. The main thing is we don't want the sunlight drying it up because as soon as it's dried up, and then it's going to be an insoluble form on the plant leaf. Of course, when the plant picks up dew later on in the day, uh, it'll re, in the case of our product, TM7, being so soluble, it can be resolubilized by the dew and then absorbed that evening. So the time of day isn't as crucial with, with Humusol products, TM7. They're designed that way because most big farmers can't just spray for an hour or two in the morning. I mean, they got a large acreage and they got to cover it. Now, what we used to use aircraft a lot, so we could get a lot done early in the morning. So then the other way of using TM7, it would be with the seed at planting. And that would be crucial because, you know, you need to start right off the bat with, with nutrition, right from that first cell division, which is why we'll treat the seed a lot of times with our product, uh, Cytoplus. Uh, Cytoplus is, is a humusol-based product, humic and fulvic acid, with a kelp extract as well as trace elements. So it's TM7 with kelp. And the kelp has further sort of synergistic effects. It has its own amino acid complex because it's a plant. It's, a, it's actually a plant. It's very high in cytokinins, which are plant hormones, and it's very high in, in trace elements. So next week, I hope to have Dr. T. Sen, who is one of the top researchers on kelp, on the use of kelp, and, and, and Per Ostrom, uh, who is with Maxi Crop Company, and I've been dealing with them for 30-some years. And the, really, the benefits of kelp, kelp extract in the diet, on plants, nutrition, soils, is a remarkable story. 
So next week will be our last show for a while. And tune in because it's going to be hopefully with Dr. T. Sen. And we'll be talking more about trace elements, kelp, and the history of the bioag movement. So this is Robert Faust with Bioag Farm and Garden Survival Hour signing off until next week. You've been listening to the Bioag Farm and Garden Survival Hour. Dr. Faust will be back next Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time right here on voiceamerica.com.